Let's not stand on ceremony, mate. Let's start the show. We would be honoured if you would join us. Let's not stand on ceremony, mate. Let's start the show. We would be honoured if you would join us. Let's not stand on ceremony, mate. trying to play dj over there what are you doing <laughs> I'll, I'll admit it actually sounded like a pretty good remix for a second or two there no uh see so yeah, this time getting everything ready and making sure our first live stream which thank you for joining everybody uh was ready to go it's first time we're doing this ourselves um how's that looking you, i had youtube up in the background to make sure the stream was going right didn't mute youtube oh. so about halfway through the stream well at least we know it's working um so yeah that, that remix <laughs> kind of gave me some ideas for uh for the future <laughs> but um oh man Let's yeah see if it's working oh, it, shit, it yeah, is it working to be. i do I, I see our live dashboard is up we're on there talking we're about a couple seconds behind yeah. but we look to be good to go and we are now on the first of what will be infinitely better i'm sure uh live <laughs> to move forward but hey we did this before with a show we used to do called smash cut and i'll be honest we're both on screen we can hear each other it's streaming. Yeah. Pretty damn good. Say, Given our track record. You know, even for all the TV that we do, I hate, I still hate being on camera. Yeah, it's Most not something you ever get used to. I'd be okay yeah. if it wasn't. If I'm I used wasn't to it. Producing. I'm used to it. I just, you know, sometimes, sometimes I hate it more than others. Right now is one of those times where I hate it because we're, we do the show on Sundays. Sunday's not on my shave schedule. No. So I, I don't. I'm not going to shave on Sunday for the preparation for the show. So I'm always going to be on here looking like I like I'm like a, I've got my COVID beard on, and I, it's because I yeah. do. Well, uh, I mean, it is Sunday. I'm. I've got my uh, my dirty sweatshirt on. Uh, before we went live, I explained to Travis why I'm using this virtual background, which you know is not exactly perfect. Because I still need to figure out why I can't get backgrounds up. It's yeah. really bugging me. But if you look. Over here, you can kind of see all the crap that's laying around my room in here that I didn't, uh, in my office, that I didn't bother cleaning up. So, um, like I said, it's going to be the first of what will be infinitely more professional and better uh, streams. Uh, and the first of many different shows we'll be doing for you guys like this. We're hoping to get it to a daily update or weekly update type thing. We're going to be streaming games and, and talking movies and shows as often as we can. Uh, utilizing this live stream as much as we can so we can get everything right too the people out there so we should probably do the intro though you want you want to let everybody know who, we are? who we are i know last week we told people who we are but do you want to tell people who we are again just in case yeah yeah that'd be good oh you want me to do it yeah see okay um if you should tune in last week to see the <laughs> the uh the confusion on who who starts the show but um I'm John. That's Travis over there. Uh, we are the Punch Storm Critics. You can check us out every day. Uh, hopefully, if you're catching the stream, that's where you came from, or hopefully we're actually getting new subscribers. But at PunchStormCritics.com, we're two D.C. area film critics. We've been doing this for quite a long time, um, and we just like to bullshit about movies. So That's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, so did you say did you say who I was? Yeah, so that's <laughs> Travis Hobson right there. I, well, first I went there, Sorry, and I wasn't, realized you were on the other side. So. I wasn't paying attention. Um... You'll find that's uh, normal. <laughs> it is somewhat normal, uh, sadly. No, um, no, yeah, so we are the Punch Drunk Critics. Uh, we've been around for more than a decade at punchdrunkcritics.com. Uh, we talk movies, TV, a little bit of everything. Me, I'm a little bit into a lot of different things, wrestling, hip-hop, comic books, games, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can see the collection of action figures, pops behind me. Um John's got a family, so he's not really into much of anything anymore. Um, uh, well, you know, thankfully, I am finally getting my foot back in the games because my kids have have uh, they're they're at this perfect age where they're old enough to want to hold the controller and play with it, but not so old that they don't realize their controller doesn't do anything yet. So I just yeah. give them both more, the old controllers and no batteries. Is it next to me? We play play games for for hours sometimes. We're into Tekken Seven right now. Um, really? 
Yeah, we were playing Shadow of Mordor for a lot, and then uh, for a long time, and then yeah, my te- son had yeah, to Again, yeah, Shadows of Mordor, that's that's nothing. But Tekken 7 is a real game. You, you got your kids playing Tekken 7? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, no, they're, again, they're not playing. They're watching me play, but... Tekken was my jam. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm just as surprised that you're playing Tekken Seven. That's a real game. Well, then you it's don't real, know me at all. Real people playing that game, man. I came up with Tekken. Martial Law was always my go-to, and then I found Huarang, and he was my go-to. You seem like an Eddie that's Gordo a, type dude. That's that's a that's a game for real players, man. That's not a casual game. You need yeah. to watch out, man. Yeah, I, I, I know you don't play it online though. Oh yeah. Yeah, I just started playing online. So I just I just picked it up like probably a week ago. I started getting the old games. I got some of the old Resident Evils and I started playing tech. So games. in other so, words, you're getting you're getting trashed online. No. Dude, because all all the moves are the same. I pick up Huarang and I'm just <laughs> triple kicking and sloppy punching. It's 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 fun, man. It's a lot of fun. I'm back into it. So hey, that sounds hey. like a challenge for maybe one of our first streams that um I can whoop Travis's ass on uh, on live internet streams for you guys to see. On what on on Twit on Tekken? Yeah. You know, I don't play Tekken. Tekken's not one of my games. I bet you I could still handle handle okay. you. <laughs> there you've had it. The first time the champions. You I know, I haven't played Tekken in years. It's not it's not one of my games. It's one of those games I prefer to watch people play because it was never my strong suit. Street Fighter and the Marvel vs. Capcom games are my strong suit. But uh yeah, we can I got we Marvel vs. Capcom too. I just haven't uh I haven't played it that much. Um I got really into Injustice for a while. I was always a Mortal Kombat guy. Yeah, but... I can't get into the Mortal Kombat games. But let's 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 not talk too much about video games here, though. Uh, unless you want to play some Streets of Rage later, but that's a different that's a different story. Um, we are here to talk about movies, and this is another week. You know, we talked about this a little bit last week, but there's been it's it's movies are are still coming out just as much as ever before. Um, it's just different now. It's yeah. just we're, we're we're watching more more stuff on. It's still enough to keep my ass busy, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, and there's a lot still a lot going on, and there's a lot of stuff that came out this week. I know you saw uh, an IFC Midnight film that I don't know much about called The Wretched. Yeah, I love those guys. Mm-hmm. IFC Midnight, that is. Really? Oh yeah, they're they're. I mean, we'll we'll talk about The Wretched a little bit more whenever mm-hmm. we get to that point. But IFC Midnight is just one of these one of these brands that came out and is super niche and they, they know exactly what, like they are Blumhouse for the hardcore genre fan a lot of the time. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, some of the stuff they put out is, is subpar, but the way Blumhouse understands horror for a blockbuster level, how to make those micro budget movies and have, have blockbuster appeal. I see midnight knows how to do that with that. So. Right. I'm, okay. I'm a fan. <clears throat> That's good, man. Um, I saw, uh, probably one of the more anticipated movies of of the year for some people, uh, which was uh, the Jesus Rolls, hmm. which is the, the the Big Lebowski spinoff. Right. That John Turturro did. I think he did it last year. I think it was at at, at Cannes, and uh, it's it's based on the French movie, I think 1974 French first movie which is um called going places i can't pronounce the french translation but it's going places going places. yeah yeah that's it <laughs> and, uh <laughs> they're going places um and uh if you've ever seen it it's 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 sort of like a a degenerate comedy which if you know what those are it's it's one of those movies that deliberately pushes boundaries a lot of sexual situations and uh, it's been, it's based on that, and it keeps a lot of that intact because this is a really sort of raunchy movie. So this isn't and just it, a spinoff of Big Lebowski. This is something using of, characters, but all together new. It's a spinoff of Lebowski, and um, and it's got Tintoro back as Jesus Cantana. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you're like, so if you're a Lebowski fan, you're like, oh damn, I want to see this. In fact, I got more questions about this this week than uh, and stuff in a, in a, over uh, in, a, in a long time. For people wanting to know about this movie, and I, they gave Totoro their blessing to make the movie, right? Um, but they don't. But it's it's telling that they're not even listed on it as like an exec producer, right? Like they're, they're nothing. They have nothing to do with it. And basically, it, it has Quintana getting released out of prison. Like the whole thing in Bugabowski is that he's a pedophile, 
right? That's his thing. He's a pedophile, bowling obsessed. He's great at bowling. But he's also a pedophile. They brush that aside in the very beginning of this movie and basically write that off like it was a mistake. And it's like, oh, okay. But he gets out of jail and he's a, it's, he's a horn dog, you know, and he's, yeah. he's, you know, going around with his buddy, playing with Bobby Cannavale and uh, Audrey Tauteau, who played Amelie. Everybody knows who Audrey Tauteau is. I love her as their promiscuous friend who has never had an orgasm. So you can guess that's one of the big goals of the movie is to get her to have an orgasm. <laughs> These guys. These guys plow her through the entire movie trying to make her have an orgasm. I mean, that's basically what this thing is. <laughs> that's not what I would have thought, but all right. <laughs> it's a it's a road trip movie, and they have a lot of sex in order to make her have an orgasm. And of course, she never does. At least not to them. Uh, she does. She does eventually at some point in the movie, but I won't tell you who does it. Um, it's one of the celebrity guest guest stars in the film, which of which there are a lot: uh, really? Christopher Walken, Susan Sarandon, Pete Davidson. JB J, J. Smoove. A lot of Pete people, Davidson man. So. Is trying hard to huh? get into Hollywood, man. I, he keeps popping up in like, Who? Pete Davidson. Pete Davidson is in Hollywood. He's got the Judd Apatow movie coming up. No, I know. I mean, what I mean is he's been trying hard for a while to get to make the Saturday Night Live transition. Like, he's going at it hard. He's not letting he's, it occur naturally. He's past it. He's, he's past that point. He's still He's been past that point ever since he made the. Uh, uh, big adolescence. He's been. But that was that. that was a month ago. I'm saying he was yeah. always. That movie was, was that movie was what was what the highest selling movie at Sundance. Really? Largely because of him. So, in fact, only because of him. Uh, so he's passed. He's beyond SNL. Uh, he's more than ready to move on from that joint. But um, but yeah, this movie just to me it's just it's a whole lot of nothing. It's I, I was expecting it to be somewhat smart at least it's not though it's it's really just really just basic uh sex humor and i just i was expecting a lot more and it's also re- kind of i don't know the treatment of women in this movie is really really lousy <laughs> really lousy that it just sounds like uh, american almost, pie for middle-aged people or something but like susan that. sarandon's character too man it's just you know she plays a uh a prisoner who just got let out of pr- uh an ex-con just got let out of prison and the guys take her in and wine and dine her and then they, you know, nail her too. And it's just like, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, well, I mean, I guess there's, I guess it's like, there might be something provocative and interesting in, in the idea of Bobby Cannavale and John Turturro running a train on Susan Sarandon, I guess. Right. Like just from like a, you know, provide what you know, provocateur standpoint. There's something interesting in that, but it's but the movie I mean, doesn't. The, the more movie interesting thing movie. about that is that uh, John doesn't really, seems he doesn't really do much. He doesn't really do much with it. It's not clever. It's not. It's not funny. What was the movie he did a few years back? Uh, it might have been more than a few years, maybe five years. So maybe it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't line up as well. But um, he did a movie with Sevilla Vergara and Sharon Stone. He was a gigolo. And it was just John Turturro hooking up with women that he could not have a chance. Oh, to up with. yeah. Man, I forgot about that yeah. movie. What the hell was that? Um, and you know what the worst part is? I actually talked to him about that movie, and I can't remember what it was. Oh, jeez. Just to name drop, just to humble brag for a second. I think <laughs> I'm going to look that up now because I, I think I remember that movie. I, I think I may have talked to him, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it sounds like a very, like, obviously much different plot. Plot, but the same type of what thing. What the hell was that movie? Um, I want to say it's it's like um, I, I I can't remember. And it's, of course, it's it's fa- it's fading, Jiglo. Oh, is it okay? I, I thought Jiglo was the title. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, because yeah. this is the one that the one that Woody Allen had a role in. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. But I mean, it sounds okay. the same. I mean, honestly, what this sounds like to me is it sounds like American Pie for middle-aged people. I mean, it's not quite that simple right but it's just you know you expect more Mm -hmm. i expect more from john taturo also but it does seem like he likes this sort of role where he gets to go around and 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 nail high women well i mean let's be honest john taturo is one of the greatest you know i I wouldn't really call him a character actor but um you know non-leading men's actors you know uh jobbing actors of the generation but 
he's not exactly a uh, you know a pinup model, you know, an A list. Um, um, what are you trying to say? You're trying to say John Turturro is ugly? Yes, yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. And um, I, if I had the power in Hollywood and I look at like John Turturro, I'd probably do the same thing. So good on him. <laughs> I mean, look, he wouldn't be the first guy to cast himself as opposite a bunch of hot women, right? But you already it's, mentioned one, Woody Allen. Happy- was that? That's the Woody Allen move. You already mentioned Woody Allen. It's, I mean, that's his it's move. Exact, it's exactly the Woody Allen move. That's what Woody Allen spent his entire career doing, mm-hmm. was casting himself opposite hot women. So, I mean, even late into his career, he's casting himself opposite like, really hot women. Yeah. <laughs> like women he had, he had no chance with ever. Like he would hook, hook, hook himself up with. And look, I'd probably do the same thing too if I were, if I were an, a director. So yeah. I can't. I don't. I don't blame him for it. It's just I wish if he's gonna do it, make a better movie with it. <laughs> it's an observation. I wasn't. I wasn't putting any judgment. It's just an observation. Yeah, this, this thing that looks like softcore. It's almost softcore porn. I mean, there's no nudity in it. Well, there's some. Very little. There's a little bit. You get some. Some. Some tow toe. Some tow toe joints. Mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, Susie could keep him under wraps, man. Joints. <laughs> What's that? I said, surprise, Susie Sarandon could keep him under wraps. She's got she's got some monsters in there. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> she does. Definitely this is does. what happens when Travis lets me be all misogynistic and he doesn't doesn't roll me back on it. I am saying things like that. But. <laughs> well, this is a movie that I mean, it, it's it deserves it though. Like this is a movie that it, it's sort of the intention, right? It's for to it's, it's for it to be risque. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't necessarily even know that it is risque because it's just. You know, like I said, it, it it goes there, but it doesn't really do anything clever with any of it. You know, right? So, and it's not and it's not funny at all. So it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really do much. For, it didn't really do much for me. So that sounds like a pass for you then. <laughs> it's a, the Jesus rolls is a definite pass this week. Yeah. There were some good movies this week. Uh, Bull with um, uh, Rob Morgan, mm-hmm. which he plays a, a former. Uh, bull rider and it's you know kind of set in the black rodeo community really good film uh that's out there um and i also saw all day and a night which is the film by joe robert cole the guy who wrote co-wrote black panther jeffrey wright right yep jeffrey wright and ashton sanders uh Mm -hmm. really great duo um and, and very similar in a lot of ways too you know ashton sanders is a lot younger um, but they, they had this sort of internal thing going. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and Jeffrey Wright, we haven't seen him play this kind of character in a long time. He plays um, basically a street thug and a, a dope head. Um, but he's just really hardcore and street. And he hasn't done that kind of role since really early in his career. Um, it's a solid film. It, it, I was talking to my, my buddy, Wilson Morales from, from Black Film. And uh, we were discussing it, and I was just like, "Yeah, it's a it's a good movie, but um, Cole wasn't really stretching, you know, really stretching himself here. It's it's mm-hmm. kind of your typical urban drama about life in the life on the streets, um, kind of black men perpetuating the cycle of criminality and violence that leads that always leads to to prison. It's it's that sort of thing. But the thing, the one thing I did admire about it is that it's it's really unsparing." It doesn't. I mean, it gives you the bad news right up front. <laughs> like, like, like this ain't gonna be a happy ending. Uh, so don't look, don't look for one. Um, I, I, I kind of, I appreciate movies that can do that and still hold you. Well, yeah. Still hold your yeah, attention. I, mean, I give it right there. So if you can, yeah, I give it credit for that. I give it credit for that. It's worth seeing. It's on Netflix. Awesome. Yeah, actually, I did. I had that mark because Jeffrey Wright. He's he's been. It's funny you mentioned him earlier in his career playing at Street Tough. Is that's where, and I, I've said this on on pretty much every iteration of shows we've done. It's strangely come up somehow, but I've I've loved Jeffrey Wright ever since the first chapter he made, the Samuel L. Jackson did, where he played Peebles. Yeah. He was he was like a neighborhood drug lord, and I didn't see him in anything that I remember for years after that. But I mean, everything from playing Felix Leiter in in Bond to Hunger Games, everything he does, he's he's. We get to see him in Bond always, again soon too. Yep. Yeah, I was, I was so happy when it showed up in the trailer. He was there because yeah. that's he was he showed up in Casino Royale and then he was kind of ghost. I think he showed up like a second or two in the other ones, but their chemistry and the way he 
featured into it. I was like, that's that's something you should hold on to. But Jeffrey Wright has chemistry with everybody. Yeah. Well, he's seen, and he's one of those, those people that seems like no matter what he right. tells you, it could it could change your life. Like he's got that gravitas to everything he says. Where yeah, when he's, he's talking, a lot you like listen. He's a lot like how a Morgan Freeman is, where everything they say seems important, like no matter what. Right. And you know, he's a, a person who can be. He's always got this sort of patriarchal thing going for him no matter what he does mm. um which is why it's interesting to see him in this kind of role again um he still has that though and, and that's what makes it you know which is what makes it so i guess moving in a lot of ways is that he's still got that that you know fatherly aspect to him but his character is out of control right you know, uh, violent and aggressive and and on drugs a lot of the time and abusive and you know but then he has these like these moments of of clarity where he like shows sensitivity to his to his son who's played by ashton sanders um you know so it's it's one of those things where it's he's kind of pulling you in in different directions right well i can imagine that that ashton sanders has that too ashton sanders has that ability too uh he's a guy he really broke out from after moonlight Mm-hmm. And after that, he's been playing a lot of these roles where he plays these guys who are kind of broken down by the system, you know, systemic racism and and uh, stuff like that. Um, he's taken on a lot of those roles, and this is just another one for him. He's, he's good at this one, too. The movie has issues, but it's not those two. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, Netflix has been really, you know, I think streaming is always going to be. What? Body. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I was gonna say I think streaming is always gonna be spotty, but the um they they the quality of someone they're putting out is is better than their quality. Before you be like once or twice a year, you get something major. And they're shitting on a lot of stuff though, man. I mean, just this week alone, I think we had three or four Netflix movies. Um, because I know we had, I think the I think half of it might be a Netflix movie. I'm not sure. Um, mm-hmm. But we also had Dangerous Lies, and it's just like a lot of stuff coming out on Netflix. Now. Did Did you watch that Dangerous Lies? No. Oh, okay. Because I I haven't bothered to look up, but I I will be upfront with you, dear audience. I'm a big Camila Mendez fan. She's uh I was watching Riverdale with my wife. We watched the first season. It was pretty good, and and I'm a fan. It means so. it means she must be hot. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I don't even need to go any further. I already know yeah. she's hot as soon as you said you're a fan. No, well, I, yeah, in this case, it is it is solely based on that because I've only seen her act as, as Veronica in Riverdale. On, Riverd- on Riverdale. Is she Veronica? Yep. Yeah, it's Veronica on Riverdale. I mean, you're not going to see somebody's acting jobs on Riverdale, really. So, um, but yeah. Um, and I mean, like with Extraction, the only thing I'm, I'm wondering is their release plan. Like, if, if with COVID and the quarantine, don't you kind of pull all the release valves as quickly as possible for all this? Because they do have a lot of stuff they're sitting on. And I understand that release schedule and you want to peter it out, but don't you, don't you want to like kind of push all this stuff to the front line while you have this captive audience that can't go to the movie theater and all that stuff? I don't, you know? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you want to put it all out there, but it seems like they're, that's what they're doing. Like they're putting, right. they're just dumping a lot of stuff out there and a lot of it's really hit or miss. Mm. Um, but then again, Netflix movies are always hit or miss. Pretty much. So, and it's 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 interesting because back when Netflix really started getting into movies, and they were bringing them all to Sundance, or they were picking them up at Sundance. And I remember having having this conversation probably with you, and, and I'm sure with my buddy Chris, mm-hmm. how Netflix movies early on would come out, and then everybody would just sort of forget them, like they like they didn't really exist. Right. Um, like really some really good ones too, like. I don't feel at home in this world anymore with Melanie Linsky, you know, stuff like that would just come out. And then like the week, a week later, it would just be it would, like it vanished. Yeah, and, zero shelf life. And then, and then stuff with really big names like war machine with Brad Pitt would come out and it would just vanish. And yeah. it's like, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> and then, and then, but then all of a sudden they started getting all this prestige and they started making movies like Roma that would break out and get mm-hmm. awards and stuff like that. But, and then, you know, movies like the Irishman and it's like, yeah, but, um, probably about ninety percent of those movies are still just going down the memory hole. Oh like yeah, a movie, yeah, yeah. A movie like Dangerous Lies is is going down the memory hole. Yeah, there's no like, doubt that it's it's you throw it throw it against the wall and see what sticks. But you know, one well, thing that I meant to talk about last week that we missed when we were talking about Extraction is 
um, the globalization that Netflix is doing and how it's getting, um, you know, attention in areas of the world, filmmakers of the world, and actors of the world that haven't been getting it um, previously. I mean, everybody knows that uh, major movie studios have been coordinating with uh, Chinese studios to get some of the funding and, and to get better box office in China. That's why you see things like the Transformers movies. There's always a scene that takes place in some part of China. Well, with Extraction, what you see is how that's starting to happen with Netflix in India. Um, India is, has a huge Netflix fan base. That, or anybody that has looked at the Netflix queues or, and the recently trending and all that stuff will notice there's a ton of Bollywood-style films that are showing up within the last, like, six months. And now they're starting to do that uh, and, and branch it out there. So, I mean, it, it, one, of the, one of the things about the globalization of Netflix that's really annoying to me is how much... <laughs> Freaking cool content. Let me finish. It's not going to be racist or anything. Um, yeah, much- you didn't see me. You didn't see me. I was playing video games while you were talking. I saw you. I was, I was planning to ignore it because uh, <laughs> that's the level of re- I give no respect. I am. I am, I am trying to play WWE 2K20 and it's pissing me off right now. So. Oh my bad. I thought we were doing a show. Go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm not doing anything that active. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So, um, like. We'll, we'll sit there and look through all the shows, and we're, we're bringing the, into, like, Supernatural-style uh, shows, like Winona Earp we just started watching, and things like that. And there are so many cool shows from countries that I've never seen content from before, like, uh, you know, stuff from Bra- directly from Brazil and, and from Chile and in and, and all parts of Europe. I'm not talking about just, like, Italian movies or just uh, movies from India, but, like, Czechoslovakian TV shows that have these really ultra-cool concepts. Um, right. it's only annoying because you have to really, I have no problem with a subtitled show or, or movie, but I tend to like want to lay down and do two or three other things while I'm watching a movie at home and you can't do that with subtitles. But, um, I mean, it's just, it's a really cool effect of, of kind of making the world of filmmaking even smaller where Hollywood is becoming less and less important to the whole, to the whole thing in terms of, of people coming from there and filmmakers coming from there and all that. But, um, yeah, I don't know how I went down that political rabbit hole, but I saw Wretched. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about that at the beginning. I have I didn't have a segue, so I, I did what I could. Um, I have seen Midnight released a movie called The Wretched this week. Uh, the the Pierce Brothers. Um, at least I hope I'm remembering that correctly. It's a very very standard um, plot. This kid is spending the uh, summer with his dad. Uh, his parents are getting divorced, um, and there's neighbors living right next door, and the kids just started working in the marina. Regular 14, 15-year-old. No, he's 16. 16-year-old kid. And then you find out that there's a witch in the woods, <laughs> and weird shit starts happening. And Sorry, my all... entire shelf. No, not my shelf, but I have, like, a stack of pops over here that need to be put yeah. away, and they, like... A bunch of them just top it over. Yeah, that's how interesting my stuff is. I'm knocking things over at his uh, his house while I'm telling this. Um, nah, I was trying. But, I was trying. I was trying to move the child. Release it. I knew they were planning on it, but I didn't know what the. Anyway, um, they, got a, they got a new wave of them coming out. It's it's okay. super. It's it's a really you know I talked earlier about IFC Midnight and knowing how to use scares. It's the 17 and above. You're fair game to be killed. 16 below. 16 to 15, 13. Probably not below that. You won't get killed. Um, yeah. And they fall right in the middle, so it gives it this real instability. If you don't know what's going to happen to this kid, you don't know if he'll make it through, mm-hmm. if his friends are safe. And um, there's a whole Amblin feel to the whole thing as well. Uh, in a J-horror movie, uh, if you watch the trailer for The Wretched, which you can ch- check out at punchdrunkcritics.com, you'll see like a tree with these witch hands coming out of it and, and uh, there's a scene where there's a dead deer and witch hands are coming out of it and it's it's repetitive and it's standard and it's done so perfectly that it is creepy as all hell um i was i was actually really surprised by by how good this movie was um again it's not even groundbreaking but it's proof positive that if you know what you're doing you don't need an original idea if you put care into it you can take an idea that's been done to death you can take the least scary of any monster. I mean, everybody thinks of witches. They don't think of Blair Witch. They think of Hocus Pocus witches. You can take something like that. It's totally not scary. Put some care and time into it. Do it the right way. And you come off with something that's that's pretty damn special on its own. So um, that's available on VOD uh, as of last Friday. So you can check that out as well. Nice. And some big, big, a big show coming out. I know you said you hadn't seen it yet, but I it just... 
this this story blew my mind and i didn't realize that the show was going to be not based on it but included elements of it is uh ryan murphy's hollywood that just hit netflix this past friday about the um i've only seen ryan murphy had puts out too many goddamn shows yeah well you know when they're going to pay you that much and just i just finished watching the politician not that long ago oh yeah already is another one and he's got like another season of american horror story and i think another season of american crime story like, yeah i'm he's... still i'm still behind by two seasons of the american horror story but um hollywood man it's 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 gorgeous but it's about um post-war hollywood you know these all these people yeah. coming back from the war and trying to make it big but that's not what surprised me i love all that stuff but what surprised me was our main character um you, you know the whole story about scotty bowers i don't know if you ever read that book called full service oh uh, i know yeah, that 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 takes front and center stage with basically, and now I I've, I've done some legitimacy checks, and it seems like a lot of people accept what he's saying. I mean, are you on board with Scotty Bowers telling the truth, or do you think some of it's made up, or all of it? You mean about him sort of being like a like a Lord of the Stars? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I believe that that part of it. I don't know if I believe every single story he's told. Right. So for anybody that doesn't know, Scotty but, I, but I'm not I'm not I'm not an expert on Scotty Bowers either. So I don't I can't say with any kind of certainty by any of it. No, yeah, but, we're not testifying against Congress. I'm just curious if if I was yeah. naive for thinking it was true. I, I mean, I, I know I know the story about as much as anybody who's heard of him, but that's mm-hmm. about as far as it goes. Yeah. Um, so for anybody out there that doesn't know, he was uh, he was a guy that came to Hollywood right after the uh, right after the war, and he started working at this gas station and. I don't remember how it happened, but soon, sooner or later, the gas station basically became a, a brothel. Like, people would pull up to get gas, and he had a bunch of good-looking guys working there. And people would pull up and take a guy. You know, guys would pull up and take guys. Girls would t- pull up and take guys. And um, I just, I, you know, when, when that came into, into the show Hollywood, I was like, wow, they're really going here with this. Because there were some crazy stories out of that book. Who knows how much are true, but, you know, given how strict everything was in Hollywood, the crazy stuff that they did, that the studios did with fixers and all kinds of stuff in Hollywood back then, it, it wouldn't surprise me. So I'm totally interested to see where the rest of that show goes. Plus, Samara Weaving is a great actress. She is a good actress, though, seriously. <laughs> she was awesome in The Babysitter. Bruce, um, Ash vs. <laughs> Evil Dead, you know, she's, she's actually a great actress. I can't believe those are the two things you mentioned for Samara Weaving. I kind of blanked, but um, oh, uh, I forgot Ready or Not. Obviously, that's probably what most people would know her from now. Um, yeah. What else is there? The Babysitter I mean, was awesome, so I'm I'm good with that. I mean, she just did, she just did Guns Akimbo with Dana Radcliffe. That's right. I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, I need to see that. It, I've seen it on my VOD, but I I can't pull the trigger. It's, pun intended. It's, it's not that great. Um, did you see that? Did you see that that video that Zoe Bell and all those other actors put together? The no, I saw you put something up, and I meant to go back and watch it, but I, I know you love Zoe Bell. So. Oh, you know, gotta, you know, I got you know, you know, I got to think for Zoe Bell, yeah. and I'm still embarrassed by the one time I met her. But um, can you tell that story again? I, we did it before on here, but I'd like to. Hear no, that. I'm not telling that story. Again. <laughs> I'm not telling that story again. Right. Um, no, uh, we'll have but that yeah. for our Patreon members. We'll have a special uh, special event show where you can see try it's to tell the story. So much fun. It's such a fun video. It's Zoe Bell, Scarlett Johansson, Florence Pugh. I mean, Jesus, Zoe Saldana, Lucy Lawless. It's like everybody. Um, Daryl Hannah's in it too. It's just all these women, badass women, stunt female stunt women too. Tracy mm-hmm. Thompson is in there. I love Tracy Thompson. Rosario Tracy. Dawson's in it. I mean, it's just and it's just them throwing punches at each other and they, they all connect. You know, they're like hitting each other. Um, but, you know, but they're like, they're all in different places. They're all in their homes. Um, it's just, it's freaking fantastic. They did a version of it on, uh, AEW wrestling this week. And that was the first place I had seen anything like that. Um, I don't know which one did it first. And I, I'm probably going to guess that Zoe Bell and her crew did it first. You're not going to like the answer to that question. Huh? You're not going to like the answer to that question. Cause unless they shot that video a while ago at the very beginning of the quarantine videos, just like that started popping up. My niece did one for her soccer team where. And again, that's true. I have seen people on TikTok doing stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But not nearly as much fun or as creative as this. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. 
if you have the uh, game in it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I have seen people doing it on TikTok, but I also hate TikTok, so I don't like looking at that stuff or giving anybody credit for it. Yeah, that's um, a man zone for me. I I, I, I haven't even looked at what TikTok is. I'm guessing it's like TikTok's, Vine, but I'm not getting into it. Basically, TikTok is just people dancing to music for a few seconds. It's just awful. I can't stand it. Um, the things you can make million dollars with these days. <laughs> yeah, it's stupid. Um, uh, Orphan Khan died this week, man. Oh, I'm sad. Yeah. I was really broken up about that, actually, uh, the day that happened. Um, yeah, he so was, was amazing. Came, we, the news came out really, like, really late into the night mm-hmm. when most people were asleep. And of course, I was awake because I'm a night owl. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had written my thing for, for Punch Drunk Critics for it that night, but I was really broken up by it. And both me and Rocky were, because me and Rocky are a huge Irfan Khan fans. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were both talking about that that time I met him at Sundance. And I had put, the, put this in my, my blog post about it, uh, the story about when I had met him. <clears throat> and it was, it was back in 2014, because it was for the sort of lunchbox. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, great movie. And um, I was talking to him then. I was embarrassed because I had my Scott Pilgrim versus the World t-shirt on. <laughs> And, uh, and I was there to, to talk to, like, arguably my favorite actor in the world at that time. Uh-huh. Um, Scott Pilgrim T. Uh, but he was completely cool. And uh, after the interview, I had asked him, I was like, hey, man, my friend Rocky is a huge fan of yours, even bigger than me. It's like, let's freak her out. Could you just give her a phone call? Oh, and he did? Fuck yeah, man. He did it. Like, he was like, yeah, let's do it. Oh, that's all. Awesome. And, and he called her. And she, I remember she was at work, and uh, and she, he, he called her and said, hi. She's like, hello. And he's like, this is Irfan Khan. And the scream from, from the <laughs> other end of the phone was just oh, God. And she was just in tears talking to him, and they had this great conversation. She, she looks at him like a father figure, like, you yeah. know, the roles he's played, and, of course, the heritage and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. But it was just an amazing moment. It's my favorite moment from, moment from Sundance. And he was just the coolest person super nice really humble and gracious and i loved everything he was in i loved him and he's probably the nicest person i ever interviewed and uh so having him pass away it's jesus 53 years old man yeah it's way too young about the same age my dad was and my dad was 53 54 years old when he passed away um it was really sad and really broken up about it that night um yeah yeah. there's i happen to um I, i have a buddy of mine is uh is lives in India. He's, he's, he's Indian. Lives over there. Uh, Sam Kalik. And um, I happened to talk to him the day that this was that after this happened, and he was like a national treasure over there. I mean, people are are oh, broken yeah. from it. Um, and you know, and you could even hear like they had been fighting his cancer with him the whole time. Um, you know that like you know you could really hear it in in the accounts. And that just goes. To, speak about what type of person he is. I mean, if you cannot meet people and have that kind of effect on them, um, and let's just point out the story you just told. I mean, it seems like a small thing, but you don't get that happening very often where people take a minute out, even a minute, even a minute, and they're busy and all this other stuff, but to take a minute out and call somebody just because to make their day, I mean, it sounds like the simplest thing in the world, but it doesn't happen, you know? Yeah, no, it's true. It was just a phenomenal moment. I don't know if I'll ever have another moment quite like that um, with another actor. You know, it's not the kind of thing you just up and ask somebody, hey, can you call my friend? Yeah. You know, yeah. one of those things. And then much less to have them be willing to do it right. so eagerly. But uh, but yeah, it was fantastic. 2020. Yay. Yeah. I think we'll probably never meet any more slips again anyway. So no. it doesn't really matter. And even if we did, they wouldn't let us within six feet of them. So yeah. No more selfies. No more. Uh, oh, oh, there's not going to be. There's not going to be any more of those. It's not going to be. Hey, can I get a photo after the interview? Nope. You sure can't. Yeah. <laughs> you sure can't. It didn't really occur to me until you just said that, but you're 100 percent on point. Yeah. Not hey, gonna give, get give me one second. I gotta go check something. I'll be right back. I hear my kids making some ruckus. So you take the next thing. I'll be right back. It looks r- super weird with you getting up out of the background. Uh, <laughs> it looks really strange. Uh, I don't know. What do you want me to talk about now as you're gone? Um, I pretty much talked about all the reviews I saw for this week. Although we do got a bunch of them up at Sundance. Uh, at Sundance. 
punchdrunkcritics.com right now. Um, like I said, the, uh, Jesus Rolls, Bull. Uh, you got a review of The Flood with me and a Hetty that's supposed to be fantastic. Uh, All Day and the Night, got that review. Uh, Tammy's Always Dying with Felicity Huffman that she's getting great reviews for. I did not see it myself personally. Uh, and the half of it, um, which is also out, I believe, on Netflix. Got a review of that up as well. And there's more than that because the wretched stuff is up that John is talking about. Uh, Khalil did a review of Soul City, a TV series. What What did you do? <laughs> the fun of live streaming uh, with kids in the house. Put my kids down to um, take a nap. I'm out of breath running downstairs before we started. And my son's been having like night terrors very rarely, but he'll wake mm-hmm. up screaming. Yeah. You know, Murphy's Law, he just uh, he just had a little little issue. But we're good now. Oh, uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk about some of the stuff that's that's going on this week, too, man, because uh, the most prevalent news story that we get every day now is what movie got moved. <laughs> right. <laughs> what movie got moved where? So, so Paramount is doing a whole bunch of crap right now. And Paramount is trying to Paramount's basically trying to revive everything, Transformers and G.I. Joe. Which, I mean, the last well, G.I. Joe, Joe never movie really was... stopped getting made, right? Huh? G.I. Joe never really stopped getting made. I mean, that Snake Eyes movie's been in production for a while. Yeah, but there hasn't been a G.I. Joe movie since 2013. Wow. Yeah, I guess it has been that long, huh? Yeah, G.I. Joe Retaliation was 2013. Snake Eyes comes out this October. Mm. But... That's still the first G.I. Joe movie in seven years. Yeah. So, yeah. And they're using that. That's the one with uh, Henry Golding, which I, I mean, I like that decision, except you're going to have to take the mask off. You can't mm-hmm. have Henry Golding there and and be Snake Eyes who never takes his mask off. You can't have that. So he's going to take the mask off, which is automatically going to make him not like start, not like Snake Eyes. Yeah, well, so <laughs> I'm, already, I'm already against it, and I ain't seen a single frame of it. Poor Ray but, Park, um, man. That guy's Ray Park is screwed. Every t- he, one of the best physical, like action actors out there, and he he plays all these super cool roles. But as soon as you see his face, like his most visual role, other than I guess Darth Maul, would be like Toad from X Men, which and, he helped out with that Clone Wars battle, by the way. He did. Yes. Yeah, we were going to talk about that in a, in a few minutes as well, I suppose, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah, we're, we're definitely going to get around to it, but mm-hmm. but uh, but so so uh, so this, so what Paramount is doing is they they set up a new J.I. Joe film that's going to be coming out. So they're, they're reviving J.I. Joe mm-hmm. and Transformers. So J.I. Joe has a movie coming out. It's going to be a follow up to Snake Eyes. Um, so it's going to follow along now. Snake Eyes is sort of like a soft reboot of the entire franchise. Right. So this new J.I. Joe movie is going to come after that, and they've got that set up for. They give that a date for it. Uh, they didn't give it a date for it. Nah, but it's written by the, by the duo that that wrote Seabird, which is that Kristen Stewart movie where she plays Gene Seabird, which is mm-hmm. they, he's the best thing about it because Kristen Stewart's always the best thing about everything she's in. Right. Um, <laughs> you get on me when I say things like that, but I no, but I but I legitimately like. I don't think Kristen Stewart's hot. Like I think she's a good actress. Like that I don't smile just said something different. <laughs> what? I mean she she she's she's gorgeous, but I'm just I'm just busting your balls. Go ahead. She's not, she's, she's attractive. She is attractive. Mm-hmm. But when we talked about Charlie's Angels, she was like she was number two. Like she's not. Well, that's because she was the next to Naomi Scott. I mean True. A lot of people are gonna be number yeah. two next to Naomi Scott. But Kristen Stewart is not somebody that I look at and I'm like, she's so hot, I'm gonna like everything she's in. Right. No, that. Um, she, I actually think she's a good actress and she gets mm. bad. She gets, she still gets, you know, hammered for, for Twilight, which is like 20 years ago. I don't want to hear about that shit anymore. Yeah. Um, but anyway, but anyway, she has nothing to do with this as yet. Um, but yeah, so new GI, new GI Joe movie. They don't know anything about it except it's coming up after Snake Eyes, but it sounds like they're trying to use Snake Eyes as the back door to a new. G.I. Joe movie, which I mean, I like Retaliation. Yeah. I didn't like the first one, The Rise of Cobra. I thought it was pretty bad. No, it wasn't uh, until Retaliation they knew what they were playing with. They knew what the toys in their chest were. I mean, Retaliation was 
to me, retaliation was a lot like Punisher War Zone. Like it was very, um, it was very uh, faithful to the source material. But you know, the first GI Joe was, I, I, I don't know what they were trying to do. Remember who so, directed Retaliation? Uh, John Chu, wasn't it? Yeah, it was John Chu. That was why it was better because Steven Summers did the first one. Right, Steven but I mean, Summers, they let him do everything, and and there's still Steven Summers hasn't done anything good since the the first couple of Mummy movies. Wow, yeah, you're right. But, yeah. I mean, if you take G.I. Joe, you've got, you know, you look at the Marvel Universe. I know this is not a comparison, really, but one of the one of the, the big draws for Marvel and DC is this ridiculously deep, um, you know, trove of characters you have. And G.I. Joe was, like, the A1 best at coming up with all these different, I don't want to say rich, but, you know, fleshed out characters to sell all the uh, all the action figures to and they had one of the best um you know they're one of the best villains in anything like it you know with cobra commander you can have some serpentor and all the other people if you want but even just the imagery i mean in retaliation when they drop those cobra banners down off the white house and uh you know you see cobra commander coming in on the big ass uh fan jet standing up there right. i mean it's something that could be so freaking cool if they just do it right and that's why i was really surprised at retaliation they didn't try to take another stab right after that but i mean well it didn't make enough money it made like 350 through 60 360 million worldwide yeah i yeah. think it, it did it did slightly better than the first movie did but it should have done better because remember that was during the height of franchise viagra dwayne johnson right and yeah. it was like it was like the one movie that that yeah it did better but it didn't do like massively better right you know, yeah, but and then they shot themselves. They, added, they killed Bruce Duke Willis in the first ten minutes. Bruce Willis was in it also, and they they added a lot of big stars to it, and it just you know it did fine, but just mm-hmm. not enough to warrant to another one. It's not as if they didn't talk about it either. I mean, Lord knows I wrote enough stories talking about GI Joe three that never happened, right? Uh, so I mean, it's, it's not as if they didn't they didn't think about it, mm-hmm. but it's just it, I don't think it ever seemed fi- financially viable. Um, I still don't know. They're gonna have to come up with some sort of. I think they're making a mistake. Let me just just go 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 from that angle. I think they're making a mistake by doing this as as try as clearly trying to build a cinematic universe. Yeah, you would like, hope that thought would would have left a, a lot mistake. of people by now. But that's a mistake. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I, everybody. It seems like everybody still is still trying to build cinematic universes, and it's just like just the wrong idea. Um, Marvel managed to do it, and that's no one else. Literally, no one else has been able to do it. Yeah, not successfully. No one has been able to do it. Not Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers took this backdoor route too, trying to you know trying to backdoor their way into a cinematic universe, and it didn't work. And and now Paramount is trying to do the same thing, and they're doing it with Transformers also, because Bumblebee is gonna is leading into a, a cinematic universe that's gonna be a new Transformers film coming out in 2022. That's the other story. Um, we don't know who's what it's gonna be about though. It's gonna be one of those two movies though that we learned about a few months ago. Like one is the the uh, quote possible Beast Wars movie no. by James Vanderbilt. And then the other one is a, uh, uh, I believe, a prequel of some kind. Uh, no, the, no, no. The, the other one is the one that's a follow-up to Bumblebee, but it's not like a Bumblebee sequel. Right. Just one in the same universe. The prequel is the animated prequel that they're doing with Josh Cooley, the guy who did Toy Story 4. But that's not set in that same universe. It's totally separate. So... A lot of stuff going on with both of with Hasbro's two biggest franchises. And honestly, I'm not that excited about either one of them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm curious about the animated prequel just because I love the cartoon so much, but it's going to depend on the approach. Yeah. So I, I've never seen Beast Wars. I, I didn't, I mean, Transformers was never Beast really Wars. my thing, but. So hated think, Beast Wars. Oh, okay. So it's not, there was a compelling story to tell. It's just, I feel like. Look, look, don't take me as, as like, as indicative of what others thought, because a lot of people love Beast Wars. And it, certainly if you watch the show, it looked cool as hell. I mean, it had mm-hmm. the CG, CG graphics. You know, it was it was definitely different. Right. But 
wasn't, it just wasn't for me because I've always been a G1 guy. So, yeah. you know, I don't. I don't. I never liked all the spinoff things from Transformers. None of them ever worked for me. So, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm having a hard time getting excited about either one of these things. And I feel like there's going to come a point where eventually they're like, let's do just Transformers versus GI Joe, like they did in the comic books. And I'm going to be like, well, I mean, they're basically almost there, aren't they? I mean, every single one has. I mean, if you, you take out Josh Duhamel, you put in Channing Tatum as Duke. And you got, you know, uh, you, you just called Tyrese uh, Roadblock, and you, you got the start of it right there. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm just, like you said, I'm not interested in it at all anymore. I mean, I, Bumblebee was great. I liked it. Yeah, I had a good time it. with the Transformers movies, but I'm not interested in going back to all. Snake Eyes and, and G.I. Joe is another story. I think there's, if they do it right and they, they embrace the cheesiness, the propaganda. I mean, a good G.I. Joe movie should be shot like, like a propaganda movie, especially when you're showing the Cobra side of things. It should be flags and banners waving everywhere. It should be really lean into that cheesy 80s Reagan Reaganomic patriotism. The, the propaganda people. should be some propaganda should be equal on both sides. Jad Joe was as much propaganda as G- Cobra was. You sound like a Cobra sympathizer. <laughs> no, I sound like somebody who recognizes that both used propaganda. No, I, yeah, I know. But I'm, what I'm saying is <laughs> Cobra was always, you know, you can you can politicize anything, can't you? Um, no, that's not politi- that's not political politicization of anything. They they were both you, they both used propaganda. You just said flag waving and banners. Jad Joe waved more flags and banners than anybody. Well, right, but right after that, I said it should really lean into that '80s hyper patriotic, cheesy Reagan Reagan style yeah. Hot politics. Yeah, yeah, that was that was that was all propaganda. <laughs> I know, and that's that's what I was saying. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, I mean, so it should be both. It's if, if they want to show the show the show both sides doing it and and making something of it, that would be fun. that would be great. I'd 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 love for it to be done Starship Trooper style. Like I think yeah. that would be that would be a great way to do a GI Joe, and it'd be different. No, I, mean, I don't want to see a straight up more than surface level. I mean, just by just by making it surface level look like that. Even if you wanted to do it almost dead serious. Uh, if it looks like that, if you embrace the colorful nature of the characters, um, you, you embrace these crazy backstories and the, the, the weird stuff that can happen, um, you know, when, when putting these people together and you embrace the far out tech without making it your own. I mean, the tech in G.I. Joe is awesome. They, they found the, the, the coolest vehicles to put in certain places, but it was already cool enough. That's what happened with the first G.I. Joe movie is they took something really cool and they're like, wouldn't G.I. Joe's have like, exosuits and have they're gonna have to they're gonna have to do something like i mean they're gonna have to play up the the satirical aspects of it they're gonna have to because i don't think i don't think anybody's interested in seeing um you know toys representing soldiers on the battlefield basically i don't think anybody else than me are pretty much yeah, I'm but <laughs> I think there's there's too much that's gone on. I don't think anybody's interested in it, and yeah. I think that's I think that's one of the things, honestly, that hurt the first two movies. GI Joe is really really tough. Like you can I can understand uh, why it worked in the '80s as a cartoon and why it doesn't work live action with real people with real bullets mm-hmm. and in and real and what should be and what it was in those movies real casualties. Remember. Chang Tatum's character dies in the second one. Yeah, um, yeah, and then the cartoon was all red and blue lasers. What's, what's and, the? I mean, already it's 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 already too serious to represent the the cartoons and the comics that we liked. Yeah. Um, well, everybody remembers that opening animatic where like there's a, a a jet flying in, and then boom, it gets blown up, and there's a huge mushroom ball ex- explosion, yeah, and then after the explosion, you look at a parachute. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, in G.I. Joe, the cartoon, nobody ever got shot. Or they no. got, they would get shot in the hands and they would drop their guns. Right. That's what happened all the time. That's why when Duke took that, that Serpentor snake to the chest, it was so, it was so mind blowing. Right. G.I. Joe, the movie, you know, it was so, it, it shook us all as kids because we were like, we haven't seen blood on this joint like ever. Yeah. And Duke, like, Duke like no one's hurt. ever been hurt like this ever on this show. It was like, right. wow, this is real stakes. You know, we are, we are super into GI Joe, but it is uh, we are nearing the hour mark. So uh, 
we got to wrap it up um, before all these meetings and things that I have set up shut down. So, um, how much time do we have? We have about three minutes. Okay. Um, well, okay. So, so we yeah. wanted to talk about Clone Wars, but maybe we can do a midweek episode. Tomorrow is May the fourth. May the fourth be with you all. Uh, Disney Plus is airing two things tomorrow for uh, Star Wars fans. You have the finale of Clone Wars, and you have uh, the Mandalorian behind-the-scenes show that they're doing. Um, I know we both really want to talk about Clone Wars, but maybe we do that after the finale and we can wrap everything up. I just main thing I wanted to, to press upon for it was how awesome that scene was, of how awesome it looked, that scene of Ahsoka in the middle of that control room with clones all around her, just, you know, and smoke rising up. Oh, it was amazing. Her versus... Uh... Darth Maul, great stuff. Yeah, amazing. great stuff, man. Um, they really need to package up those fight these final what, four or five episodes with Ahsoka. Mm-hmm. I think it's four episodes, whatever. They need to package them up into a single movie. Isn't that the idea? That's why I, 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 I thought that's that's like why they changed the opening credits and stuff like that. I, I don't know I, if it is. If it is, it's a good idea. Yeah, because it, it's 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 already better than the Rise of Skywalker. I mean, it's. That's it's, what hurts about this stuff is that I I will still tell everybody, anybody that asked me that I thoroughly enjoyed Rise of Skywalker um, in the theater. I was fist pumping. I felt good <clears throat> leaving the theater. I still but don't. There's, there's been a lot of of things to compare it to since. And I'll watch it and I'll still enjoy it, but it is not the great movie that I thought it was originally. I mean, things like reading Colin Trevorrow's script, um, you know, seeing The Clone Wars now, seeing this other it's less that rise of skywalker in my mind wasn't good it's more of what it could have been that it wasn't and you see that here but um, all you need to think about is how much the colin trevorrow version would have enhanced everything around it if they had stuck with it oh absolutely i mean and that that the rise of skywalker doesn't do any of that i can i can take i can understand enjoying it as as an entertaining movie because i enjoy it as an entertaining movie but that's it but it's not it shouldn't just be that. It's the finale of the most epic saga ever. It should be more than that. And it wasn't. That's 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 like my final. Well, I'll tell you now. what. Look at it this way. Look at it as the epilogue. And last year it was a final one. There you go. Snoke died and that was the end of it. And we're all good. <laughs> but we're about to get cut off here. So we're gonna check in with you guys. But uh, you need to follow us, uh, follow the Punch Trump Critics and Cinema Royale. Um www.spreaker.com slash show slash cinema dash royale underscore one. Travis is twitter.com slash punchy critic. I am at punch drunk John. Uh, you can follow the whole site at, at PDC movies. Uh, make sure to check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash punch drunk critics and facebook.com slash cinema royale show. And wherever that button is for subscribe, go ahead and you can say you are one of the first ones to subscribe. So make sure that happens as well. All right, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. Later.